All right, I guess we're ready to start. Well, let's start with prayer. Gracious Lord, we pray this day for your blessings once more and the gift of your Holy Spirit, that we might have understanding of your word, growing in faith and in love for you above all else. For Jesus' sake, amen. All right, we are up to Daniel 9. So, Daniel 9. Daniel chapter 9. All right, now... Uh, we've seen working our way through Daniel. The first half of Daniel is kind of historical, just talking about the facts of the rise and fall of Babylon. Uh, the second half of Daniel is apocalyptic. It's visions, it's, uh, it's revelations of really the... the, the human history from Babylon to Jesus and even to the end. Um, the first couple of visions we saw were weird with strange animals and things, symbolically representing different kingdoms. This chapter is different from those even in that it's not really a vision. Uh, it starts off as a prayer of Daniel's, and it ends up being a special revelation from God about the end times. Uh, it, it, too, is a little, little strange, but not as kind of bizarre as some of the earlier ones with the visions of the beasts and the, the winged leopards and things like that. So Daniel chapter 9 starts off then with his prayer, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. All right, uh, Darius, yeah, a, a name that confuses things because um, the Persian Empire in the time of Daniel was, was ruled by Cyrus. Uh, he was the first uniter of the Medes and the Persians. He really made the Persian Empire into the superpower it was. And later, after Cyrus, there is an emperor of the Persian Empire named Darius. This ain't that Darius. Uh, this Darius seems to be a Persian name for a Mede general probably the general who conquered Babylon, because he's called Darius in an earlier chapter, too. Uh, and it just says here he's made king over the Chaldeans. That's the area of Babylon. And he's made king because Cyrus, who is the Persian emperor, appoints him as ruler over this area, because Cyrus, of course, can't be everywhere at once, so he's got his individual rulers and governors in different areas. Uh, this, this general of his, who took Babylon, he makes the governor over this area, calls him a king, and you know the confusing thing of all of it is he's named Darius, which isn't even his real name, that's just the Persian name that was given to him. So this guy is the general, uh, who was favorable to Daniel. I mean, he, loved, he liked Daniel a lot, he could trust Daniel. Uh, so we've given a time stamp now that this prayer takes place in the first year of Darius, which means Babylon had just fallen. Uh, this Mede um, uh, 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 general was made a king of the area. So it just happens, all the blood and gore is fresh. You know, Babylon has fallen. So now, verse 2, and in the first year of his reign... I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord given through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. All right. Uh, Daniel says understood by the books, which means Daniel had the books of the prophets. He had Jeremiah's scrolls. So when they were taken captive out of Jerusalem... 
Evidently, either Daniel himself or some of the priests had the presence of mind to grab the scrolls and take them with them into captivity so that they didn't, you know, rot away or, or be destroyed by some marauders. So they've got the prophetic scrolls with them. And Daniel was a student of these. He studied them. He read them. He knew them. He says he read specifically Jeremiah's prophecy that talked about 70 years. That was the length of the captivity of their slavery in Babylon that they would endure 70 years. Look in Jeremiah chapter 25 and you will see probably the section that Daniel was talking about. Jeremiah 25, 8 to 14. God got very specific in Jeremiah. Um, yeah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah was the prophet in Judah just before and at the time Jerusalem was sacked by Nebuchadnezzar and carried off into slavery into Babylon. So he... He, he prophesied just right before Israel fell and told them what was going to happen. He predicted 70 years of captivity. So this is it. Jeremiah 25, 8 to 14. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. Now that's bizarre, calling a, a heathen vicious monster of a human being, his servant, and bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and a perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstone and the light of the lamp, and this whole land shall be desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Then it will come to pass, when seventy years are completed, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation and the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. So I will bring on that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, all that is written in this book which Jeremiah prophesied concerning all the nations, for many nations and great kings shall be served by them also, and I repay them according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. So there it is, laid out the whole thing from Israel's fall to 70 years of captivity to the destruction of Babylon. Daniel read this, and he knew right in front of his eyes it was happening. He could see Babylon being destroyed and a new empire taking over. So he knew they were coming to the end of the 70 years. All right, back to Daniel 9. Any thoughts or comments, by the way? All right. Chapter 9, verse 3, Daniel. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Uh, fat on the handout, fasting, sackcloth, and ashes, outward marks of repentance, represents acceptance of discomfort, of divesting of self. It is a stark, visible admission of what is inside that offends God. Here's a, here's a quote from a commentary I thought was good. Fasting helps to keep the mind unencumbered and also reminds him who practices it that he has not deserved even food from God. To remove clothing and to substitute a coarse wrap strongly reminds the supplicant that not even the comforts of good clothing are his right and due reward. Ashes were put on the head as a token of grief since Daniel sincerely grieved over his and his people's sins. You know, and I, I, ashes, ashes are a mess, you know, they leave soot black gray mess. And I don't think they just like sprinkled a few ashes on their head. I think it was hands full. I think it was, you know, if you'd have seen these guys like Daniel at this stage, he would have been a filthy, disgusting mess. He would have looked, you know, like, like some hobo that had been living on the street for 20 years, covered in soot, dirt. Yeah. 
it, it, it was truly a, truly a thing to see the way they practiced repentance. They put their all into it. All right. Um, so it is. It, this is a. This is a. Uh, it says a, a prayer and supplication. Uh, prayer we know earnest enough. The word supplication means an earnest prayer for favor, a humble prayer, even a, a kind of begging. So this isn't some kind of formalized thing. This is throwing yourself before God, begging for favor when you know you deserve none. By the way, you know what Luther's last words were? Found written on a scrap of paper. It says we are all, we are all beggars. So this idea of begging, this supplication, um, this is, this is essential to, to Christianity. Now, what Daniel does here in his prayer, really, I think, I think Daniel's, Daniel's repentant prayer here is a model for what repentant prayer should look like. Uh, you know, if you're ever wanting to know how does one repent, what does one say, this is it. You know, this is, this is, this is exactly what repentance should be. Verse 4, And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, and I said, O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. Now, notice his repentance does not just start looking at himself. Oh, I've done horrible things, forgive me. It's not a self-centered repentance. It's a repentance focused on God. First words out of his mouth when he repents is, Oh God, you're, you know, you're awesome, you're great, you're merciful. He, 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 he acknowledges the ultimate goodness of God. That's repentance. It's not based on just sorrow and, and looking inward, it's based on a merciful God who's, who's perfect, who makes promises and keeps them. So it's a, it's a beautiful way to start repentance by lauding the goodness of God. Uh, it also, as I note on the handout here, uh, it also makes the following confession of Israel and Daniel's sins all the more sad because it takes away any excuses for sin and it makes the sin all the more inexplainable. God is, has always been good. There is nothing people can point to in God as a reason why they ultimately didn't trust him and turn to sin. He's been faithful. The sin is wholly inexplainable and fully on the shoulders of those who committed it. That's repentance too. When, when we repent to God, and we, when we repent to others, for that matter, if we've sinned against them, shouldering the complete and total blame of it all is what repentance means. Anytime you say to somebody, I'm sorry you took it that way, that's not, that's not a repentant statement. You know, I'm sorry things got away and went this way. That's not a repentant statement. Repentance is taking all the blame yourself. I'm sorry, I really messed this up. This is all on me. You know, you did nothing. That's, that's what repentance should be. Verses 5 to 7. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name, to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face, as it is this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. Uh, notice a certain change here. We go from the singular in the previous verses 
uh, I prayed, I set my face. Now to the plural in verse 5. We have sinned and committed iniquity. Uh, Daniel, Daniel puts himself in the shoes of the sinner. He is one with his people under this sin. Even though Daniel was a very faithful man and didn't do what his forefathers had done to anger God, nonetheless he embraces the national sin and acknowledges that he as a sinful human being is part of it. Also notice the repetition of face. In verse 3 it was, I set my face towards the Lord God. And now in verse, where was it? Uh, there was face again here. Seven? Ah, yeah, shame of face. To us belongs shame of face. The, the, why the face? Because the face is, the face reveals the heart in a way. Uh, the, the face is, you don't really know what someone is toward you unless you can see their face. You, you can't, you know, sarcasm, how would you know somebody's being sarcastic unless you can see their face? You might take their words at face value. The, the face is the way God has given us to express those kind of inexpressible things to one another. And Daniel really brings up the face a lot in this prayer. You know, his repentance is so profound, it's reflected in his face. Uh, the love of God is so profound, it's reflected in his face. Pastor, yeah. In the sermon, the service, you always say he lifts up his countenance upon you and gives you peace. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. Yeah. The, the face is a huge thing in, in, God's, in God's showing love and mercy to us and us showing God repentance to him and to one another. And, and this is you know, part of why I think we're falling apart as a society right now under the COVID thing where everybody hides their face. Because it takes human beings out of the realm of human and makes them objects. It makes them things. Uh, same with social media. You know, you can get, why, why is everybody so nasty to one another now? Because you don't see each other's face. People are just its. If you saw somebody else's face, those little snarky little comments you make online would rip your heart out when you saw how it would affect them. You know, face to face, people don't talk that way. So the, the, the face is a terribly important thing in the way God works among his people and allows us to work among each other. Uh, I, think, I think masks are destructive of that uh, and, and in a way demonic because they take away the true humanity God has given us to show one another. Yeah, and I know they're medically so-called necessary and all that, but I mean, you, know, you go to nursing homes, they have to make nursing home visits, you have to wear those things in there. How depressing that would be, being there and never actually getting to see other people's faces. All you see is you know, bodies walk by helping you, that are, you see eyeballs sticking out there, but that, that's still not enough. There's just something so much more comforting in a face. All right, I'm, I'm off, I'm, I'm sidetracked. Um, uh, things to note here as well. Uh, he lists, verse 5, sinned, committed iniquity, done wickedly, rebelled. Four things in a row. Uh, the words in the Hebrew, first of all, uh, sinned, uh, literally means to miss the mark, to go wrong. So that's kind of a, kind of a lesser, lesser way of putting it. You know, yeah, we kind of missed the mark on that one. doesn't sound as bad as we really messed this up. Uh, but, but each one steps it up. The next one committed iniquity uh, from a Hebrew word meaning to bend or twist, to do wrong. We missed the mark. We've twisted things. The next one done wickedly. Now it's a little more blunt. Wickedly, just there's no other translation for it. And finally, the ultimate rebelled, a bold and audacious act of disobedience. So each word steps it up one more. And, and, it, and it makes what Israel has done covers all of the different aspects of it. 
we're all in on this, and we've all done these different things in different levels of offense against you. Uh, Asterix on the bottom of page one, failure to heed the words of the prophets, which he mentions in verse six, we have, and neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, uh, shows once more God's faithfulness in that he sent prophets to warn them. He gave them his word. He told them plainly what would happen if they kept on rebelling. They ignored him. And the prophets, he mentions, Daniel mentions the prophets, but there were a lot of prophets God sent to Israel in those decades right before Israel's fall. You know, the closer they got to Israel's destruction, the more God sent prophets to them. So you see kind of this list of prophets in the hundred years leading up to the fall of Israel. And there's some of the greats. You know, they had Isaiah, they had Jeremiah, they had Ezekiel, and then some of the minor prophets, Hosea, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. You know, God sent them a bunch of prophets. So there was no excuse for their continued sin. It was prophet after prophet coming to them with the same message. You, you people are all going to die and be carried off into slavery if you don't repent and stop this unbelief. And verse 7, we already spoke a little bit about the shame of face, not just shame. It's a shame so profound it's reflected in the face. Uh, the structure of God's goodness in contrast to Israel's disobedience is again highlighted yeah, in verse 7, righteousness belongs to you. you know, again, God has been perfectly good in all of this. The problem rests wholly on us. Shame of face belongs to us. Um, and unfaithfulness in verse 7. You have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed, a word which means treacherousness too. All right, any thoughts before we move on? Uh, again, in terms of this being a model of repentance, the constant intersprinkling of statements to God about his goodness, along with stark admissions of our responsibility in failing God. It's, it, his, his entire prayer of repentance is a constant repetition of this. And we see this in the next verses too, 8 to 10, which is basically just a repetition of what he just got done saying in the same format of God is good, we're bad. Verse 8, O Lord, to us belong shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, Though we have rebelled against him, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. So pretty much just a restatement of what he just said. Verse 11. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed, so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses and the servant of God, uh, Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. Uh, he doesn't just pin Israel's sin on its leaders, who are certainly responsible for leading the children of Israel into this horrible idolatry, but the people themselves have embraced it, so it's on them too. All share in Israel's disobedience. Uh, on the handout, Israel's sin is both individual and collective. Even those individuals who sought to remain faithful are now part of the collective consequences of the majority. So much for the God of individualism. Yeah, there, there were faithful people in Israel. There were people who had not followed along in the idolatry of the masses. But they bore the same consequences. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's still true. Uh, our nation is headed in a very godless and wicked way. And someday God is going to say he's had enough. And those who remain faithful are going to go down as a nation with the rest of them. 
You know, we can, we can fight and we need to fight the evils that are loose in the world right now. Uh, but just being faithful and true does not mean that our nation is going to be staying on top. The curse and the oath of the, of, uh, written in the law of Moses. Look at Leviticus chapter 26 and we'll see what he's talking about. When God gave his law... Um, God, God did two things at the end of the giving of his law. He promised his faithfulness, that he, he would be true to them, he would be their God, they would be his people. And he gave them a warning that that relationship of I'll be your God, you'll be my people, I'll take care of you, will remain in force as long as you're faithful. But if you ever fall away from my commands and live like the pagans around you, then all bets are off. So God promised that they would suffer consequences if they disobeyed. Uh, Verses 14 through 39, Leviticus 26. But if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes... Or if your soul abhors my judgment so that you do not perform all my commandments but break my covenant, I also will do to you. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease, a fever which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face, there's a face again, against you, and you shall be defeated by your enemies, those you hate, you shall... Who, you sh- so let me try this again. Those you hate, ugh, those who hate you shall reign over you. There we go. And you shall flee when no one pursues you. And after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze, and your strength shall be spent in vain. For your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall trees of the land yield their fruit. Then if you walk contrary to me, and you are not willing to obey me, I will bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. I will send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, destroy your livestock, make you few in number, and your highway shall be desolate. And if by these things you are not reformed by me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you, and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins." I will bring a sword against you that will execute the vengeance of my covenant. When you are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. When I have cut off your supply of bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall bring it back to you, your bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. And after all this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I will also walk contrary to you in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. You will eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, cast your carcasses on the lifeless forms of your idols. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty rough. Um, and it happened when Jerusalem fell. Uh, the Israelites did, in fact, resort to cannibalism during the siege of Jerusalem. I will lay your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries to desolation, and I will not smell the fragrance of your sweet aromas. Uh, That also happened. Jerusalem was utterly leveled, and the temple with it, by Nebuchadnezzar. I I will bring the land to desolation. Your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. Yeah, another thing Nebuchadnezzar did is what Russia does. Uh, They displaced the population. They carted off the natives... Took them, took them into Babylon, and then replaced the native population with Babylonians. So the enemies actually lived on the farms and on the land of the, of the Israelites. Exactly what Putin is doing in, uh, uh, in what Russia has done historically over there. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate and your cities a waste. So, yeah, God, God is very plain with what's going to happen if they disobey. Uh, And the levels of disobedience. If you do it, then seven times you get this. If you do it again, if you still do it, if you keep doing it, and ups it each time. 
So Daniel, again, knew the prophecies. He read them. He was familiar with them. Uh, and he now here acknowledges that God is, is being faithful to his word. He's doing just like he said. You know, we, we, focus, we focus a lot on God's faithfulness to his promises, his good things. Uh, and we usually mean God is faithful when it comes to grace. You know, but we should note God is also faithful when it comes to judgment. What God says he keeps um, even when it comes to these horrible judgments he laid out before Israel. He, he did this. And if he did this to his own people, how much more those who aren't his people? All right, thoughts or comments? All right, pressing on. Back to Daniel 9. Verse 12, I think. Yeah, and he, and he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster for under the whole heaven never has such been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. All right, so the, the leaders he calls judges here are judges who judged us by bringing this upon us. Uh, just the leaders of Israel, those who passed judgment, and it was the leaders who ultimately led Israel into this wickedness. Doesn't it? It's amazing how much a leader can do for corrupting people. People are just so much like sheep and always have been that all it takes is kind of one bright light to, that, they, that they focus on and they just follow blindly right off the cliff. And in Israel, you see that with their kings. They have this history of good kings. One good king, bad king, bad king, bad king. One good king, then a list of bad kings again. And the one good king will lead the people into this 20, 30 years of repentance and spiritual restoration. One bad king comes along, and they all change course again and start following the bad king. It's, it's just, they're so personality-driven instead of being focused in the word itself and what God says. Verse 13, uh, As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. So it happened just like God said, but Israel has not responded like God wants. They bemoan their situation, mind you. And I'm sure they cried out to God constantly about, oh, take this horrible suffering away from us. You know, save us from these pagan unbelievers and all of that. But they hadn't repented. They hadn't owned the sin that caused it all. That, too, is, I think, a very good lesson for us. That, that we shouldn't just cry out to God bemoaning our horrible situation without owning the sin that brought it about. You know, that's, that's where we should focus, not on just what bad thing is happening to us, but why we suffer the way we do. You know, and our bad things that happen to us are very often compounded by the fact that we, we're not facing them with faith, trusting that God is working a greater good in it all. We, we fight. So it's, um, it's very very apropos what Daniel says here about his people, it's, it's, we still have the same issues that we face in our day. Verse 14. Oh, yeah, another note. Your truth, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. That is the only truth. Not that we might understand ourselves, not that we might understand our sin, but that we might understand you. Because he is the anchor of goodness. He is the one unchangeable source of mercy and truth and goodness. That's, that's truth. Uh, contrasted, as I have on the handout here, contrasted by our culture that talks about people's individual truths and people being true to themselves, that's a recipe for paganism. Your individual truth, your truth. Pursue your truth. Right to hell. They don't finish with the last part, but they should. 
verses 14 to 15. Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. There it is again. The goodness of God contrasted to the evilness of men. And now, O Lord God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name, as it is this day, we have sinned and we have done wickedly. Again, focusing on the goodness of God. You, even, you rescued us. You did all these good things, and we have done wickedly. Continual repetition of that formula. Goodness of God contrasted with our unfaithfulness and wickedness. God is nothing to blame in any of the, the, the bad befalling his people. It's wholly on them. Verse 16. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquity of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all who are around us. Here's another interesting thing. Daniel doesn't ask for help based on the people, based on the repentance or the people in any way, shape, or form. It's, you know, not, not a matter of we've learned our lesson, now step in and help. Uh, it's, it's not a matter of we're really, really sorry for this, step in and help. Or maybe we can make, you can make something good out of us somehow, step in and help. The reason for helping rests wholly on God. Again, why should God help? Well, because your people have become a reproach to all who are around you. Uh, God's, God's name is suffering, not God's people. I mean, yeah, the people are a reproach, but the people bear his name. People are going to look at Israel and say, well, where's your God? Your God must be weak because look at you. You know, it's God who's being blasphemed by the suffering of the people. So for God's own sake, Daniel says, step in. Do something for the sake of your name, not for the sake of your people, per se. Verse 17. Oh, yeah, before we, verse 17. Top of page 3. Uh, in a world where people make their cases based on emotion and personal suffering, Daniel shows us how to make a case on God's own goodness and love. It's not an emotive argument. It's one rooted in the concrete, objective truth of God's word and promise. So yeah, according to your righteousness. You know, that's why he wants God to step in, because God is righteous. Do this because you're righteous, not just because we need it. Do it because your name is being blasphemed, not because we're being beat up or suffering. Yeah, he mentions Jerusalem and the Holy Mountain. Jerusalem represents God's people. As it went, so they went. It's in ruins, as they as a people are in ruins. Uh, but in the New Testament, the link continues in as much as the restoration of God's people is also described as the restoration and glorification of Jerusalem. Yeah, uh, the, the heavenly city descending in the clouds. Uh, that's the description of heaven in Revelation, and that's you know, Jerusalem coming down. We are Jerusalem now. We are God's people. Verse 17 to 19. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servants and his, your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Again, face. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our des desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, and for your city, for your city and your people are called by your name. Every, every ounce of reason Daniel comes up with for why God should finally fix this is God's own mercy and God's sake. Do this because your righteousness. Do it because your goodness. 
That's the only reason. Uh, note all the verbs, all the necessary actions for fixing the problem and how they are all God's verbs. Incline your ear, hear, open your eyes and see. Uh, oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, listen and act. It's, it's God, you do everything. That's the gospel. It's all God's work. Nothing from us. Get a marvelous model for what repentance should look like in us when we pray. Do it for your sake. Do it for your son's sake. Not for us. 20 to 23. Now, while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sins and the sins of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering and informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision." Now, on the handout, the fact that God sent... Uh, Gabriel to answer the prayer of Daniel before Daniel finishes praying it. In fact, at the beginning of the prayer, God doesn't even wait for Daniel to pray. Daniel starts, God sends the answer before, before the words are out of Daniel's mouth. There too, the greatness and goodness of God. His response is not because Daniel finally makes the good prayer he's been waiting for, his answer is coming to Daniel before Daniel even prays. It's all God's doing. All his mercy and righteousness. It's, it's, it's the gospel over and over and over again in this. Where was I? <laughs> there we are. It's 23. Um, you are greatly beloved, uh, Gabriel says. Uh, beloved a word which means to take pleasure in, delight in, find precious, is even a word sometimes used to covet uh, in a negative sense. So you are, you are precious to God. God takes pleasure in you. Because um, he was one of very few faithful people left. Verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people in your holy city. So this is now Gabriel telling Daniel... What's, what's to come? Seventy weeks are determined for your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of the sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Seventy weeks. Earlier, we heard 70 years. That was, that was Jeremiah's prophecy of the time of the Babylonian captivity. And, and it is that. It's 70 years-ish. Um, and here now, though, it's 70 weeks. Now, there are, on the handout, there are two ways people try to understand this. One literally, one symbolically. So literally, people say, Gabriel was saying, things are all going to happen in 70 actual weeks. I tend to believe this is symbolic. Um, the word week, weeks in Hebrew, doesn't necessarily have to mean seven days. It means a heptad of time, seven somethings. Could be seven years. It was a, it's a word used even in reference to seven years at times. Uh, it could just be seven periods of time in God's estimation. You know, it doesn't literally have to mean seven weeks. So yeah, or 70 weeks. So the, 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 the language itself in the Hebrew leaves, kind of encourages a more symbolic understanding. Seventy-somethings are determined, whatever they are. Furthermore, the number 70 itself is a highly charged and symbolic number. Uh, seven, you know, the number for God that we see regularly throughout Scripture. Whenever you see the number seven, it says something about the hand of God being involved uh, his, his holiness, his perfection being on display. 
uh, seven days of creation, well, six days plus seven, you know, the week, uh, times the number 10, which is a num another highly charged symbolic number in Jewish symbolism. Uh, the number of union, of collection, of wholeness, even of holiness. You know, so symbolically, 70 would mean a collection or a union of time is established by God. Doesn't necessarily have to literally mean 70 somethings. It means this is the number God has set up according to His will to reveal His holiness. On the handout, again, end of that section uh, before we get to verse 25. At first, this seems to be speaking to the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity ending. So yeah, the first part of that, 70 weeks are determined for your people, your city, to finish their transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Sounds like he's talking about the Babylonian captivity. From there on, it sounds like something very different. To bring in an everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy to anoint the most holy. Now it seems like he is, he's kind of skipping ahead to the messianic age. So which is it? Is he talking about the end of the Babylonian captivity or is he talking about the ushering in of the Messianic age when you know, the most holy one will be anointed? The answer seems to be both. Uh, this is the nature of so much biblical prophecy that the events of the present very often prefigure the ultimate plan God has in place at the end. So, you know, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem prefigures the destruction of, 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 of Christ himself and ultimately the scattering of the people of God. The resurrection, you know, the ultimate expression of God's goodness in creation speaks beyond itself to the resurrection of all mankind. It's like all these events are intertwined both in the present and in the future, and this seems to be the case with this too. Yes, it's talking about the end of the Babylonian captivity. Yes, it's talking about the Messianic age and what's to come. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. So we see it is talking about the Messianic age very clearly here. And it's talking about the restoration of Jerusalem, which happens at the end of the Babylonian captivity. So that they're, they're bound together, these events. Uh, as, as the handout notes, um, it's still 530 years in the future till the Messiah comes. The restoration of Jerusalem will come within a decade. Seven weeks and 62 weeks, so you've got a shorter period of time and a longer period of time. So the seven weeks, you know, the shorter period of time, restoration of Jerusalem, the longer period, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The 62 weeks... Perhaps the intertestamental period, the period of 530 years until the Messianic age begins and Christ comes. But there's these, these units of time that only God understands and that can't be read literally. A couple minutes. We'll try and finish it up. 26 and 27. Uh, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And for the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. To the end of it, uh, the end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So we get, um, after 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. 
seems a reference to Christ's crucifixion. So the 62-week period, probably, you know, that period of time before the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the coming of the Messiah, 500 years, ends with Jesus' death. And it's after the death of Christ, then, that he talks about bad things happening. Uh, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood. So evil will flood into the world. It pictures a sort of antichrist figure, one who will lead them, this prince who will lead the, the, the godless hordes. Uh, he'll make a, a covenant with the people. That is, he's going to make a promise to make their lives better in some way. Verse 27. Uh, but he's going to act in the middle of this against the church. In the middle of the week, he'll bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So Christians will suffer. The church will suffer. On the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. There's the you know, that this antichrist figure who is going to be encouraging the wickedness even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate right up until that time when God finally brings an end to it and punishes those who are making everything desolate. So you've got, you've got a vision here now of all of history from the death of Christ to the second coming. And Daniel's vision of that period of time, however long it's going to be, we're not told, is a time of suffering for Christians. That's what we're in right now. So if we're going to plug ourselves into Daniel's prophecy and what Gabriel says, this is us. We're living under that evil one who's guiding the world and bringing suffering on the church. And, and you'll notice it. You can see it. You don't, you don't have to be a biblical scholar. There is, loose in this, in this world right now, a very different spirit that can look at the same reality we see with our eyes, but see it in a, in a radically horrible and godless way. You know, that looks at the world as, how can I gain power and destroy the weak who believe in God? Now, I, I believe right now that the viciousness and evil we see loose in the world is absolutely, truly demonic. I, I think this, the, 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 the kind of secular philosophy that wants to take children away from parents and, and rule their minds is utterly demonic. Uh, and I think governments are being controlled and led by demonic forces. Uh, we're in these last days. Uh, and the desolation and everything he talks about is happening right in front of our eyes. And it's going to happen right up until that time when God says enough is enough and the end comes. So at the end of it, there's the hope of God finally stepping in and ceasing the desolations and restoring his people. But until that time, brace yourself for what's coming. All right. Thoughts, comments, or questions? That is the end. Right. There's no like establishing a new earthly kingdom where he's going to reign and we're going to serve under him. When he comes, according to Daniel's vision, that's the end. And that's just Daniel, the rest of scripture. All right, let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you strengthen us in these last days. Make us faithful to you. Speak your truth to us and confirm us in it. And help us endure, trusting in your grace and goodness for all we need. For Jesus' sake, amen.